And let's go live on do this. Facebook and LinkedIn. On a Friday morning. On Cinco de Mayo, by the way. Uh, let's see. Oh, a description is required on really? Facebook. Well, let's see. Okay. Give me a second. Oh, now let me put myself on do not disturb. All right. Okay. Let's see if that makes. Okay, I think we're live. Um, at least we're live on LinkedIn and recording. So, Ricky, welcome to the Higher Calling Podcast. You are Thank you. for all things hiring, staffing, and recruiting. It's Friday morning. We're in Florida. Life's pretty good. How are you today? I'm excited. Today is Cinco de Mayo there, Pete. What are you doing for the event? Anything? Uh, well, Ricky, it's Friday night, which means I'm going to the movies because that's what I do on, on Friday nights. And this is a big one because the new Guardians of the Galaxy comes out. So I am looking forward for your review. I might check that out tomorrow or Sunday, but that one's going to be, I cannot wait for that the, one. The expectations are high. And as, yeah. as I often um, tell you when these conversations have come up over the last few weeks, hopefully it's not a big disappointment like um, Ant-Man, the Ant-Man oh. movie was, which <laughs> still is the bottom of the list on uh, 2023 movies so far, I think, <laughs> for, for disappointments. What Just by you? a bunch of raid. <laughs> Oh, it was awful. What about you? What What do you have planned? No, well, well, you know, tonight um, we're just doing movie night because tomorrow this weekend we're looking to go to Vera Beach, and we're excited for that. Um, but tonight we're just gonna watch something we haven't seen. My my mom's staying with us right now, and uh, we haven't had movie night in a long time, so they're gonna decide. So uh, we'll we'll go from there. I'm excited, but again, I want to see your review because I saw the one you did for Ant Man. I saw you want you did for Mario. We should disagree. I thought it was a little bit more than that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, right. my, right. my reviews are up a little controversy. I like it. It's, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm obligated to do them now. So this will be review number 13 for uh, 2023. Hopefully not unlucky 13. We'll see nice. what happens. Nice, yeah. nice. Awesome. Well, but on today's Higher Calling podcast, which we know will get rave reviews, uh, we are talking about an HR person's dream. And as our resident HR person in this scenario, this is right up your alley employee orientation versus onboarding oh this is our and why there's a need for both what what do you think is that is that up your alley or what that's up my alley but you said an hr person's dream i thought it was some payday friday and and i don't get a phone call i mean that's a dream <laughs> no, no phone calls after uh after four o'clock payday friday that's right <laughs> so well, but yeah no no this is definitely as well yeah, this is definitely up my alley. I love I love talking about this because if if business leaders get this right, they're going to severely affect, in a good way, um, the tenure of a candidate who's turning into an employee. So, yes, I love this subject. I don't think uh, this is uh, – these are terms that everyone necessarily understands the difference um, when they use them. I think they're probably used interchangeably a whole lot. So yeah, yeah. let let's start by defining the two and what 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 you know just from a high level. How let's let's go ahead and start with um, with orientation. Well, no, we'll start with onboarding because that is the first step right after after an employee um, hiring decision has been made. Is it not? It is. It is. And whenever I do any kind of a HR class or a webinar, um, I always ask the audience this question. When does onboarding start? And I hear all kinds of different answers. It, it's a, they say it starts as soon as they set, they set foot in new employer orientation or they set foot uh, or they accept the offer letter. But I, oh, well, I'll ask you, Pete, when does onboarding start in your, from your point of view? I would say from the, the moment 
the uh, the hiring decision has been made. As as I said a few minutes ago, I feel I feel like uh, from your glare from those who aren't watching on video that I probably didn't hit that mark one hundred percent. But but that that's where I would say it begins. Where um, but but what what did I get wrong? On onboarding starts as soon as the candidate applies for the job. Okay. As soon as they apply for the job, it, Pete, you know this more than anybody else. Recruiters have a hard time these days. I mean, it, they can still do the job, but it's becoming more difficult, right? To not just only bring people in, but to keep them on as well. So when when I say it starts as soon as they apply, that means that the recruiter, who is also a salesperson, by the way, needs to be on their on their a game to communicate the opportunities that they can that the candidate can get in the organization and how wonderful it is to work in the organization that's when it starts to me okay i'm good i'm going to challenge you a little bit okay on this the recruiter as a salesperson why why because why is that? because to me in my opinion when whether somebody decides to, to apply or continue with the application process in, in or for an organization, in my opinion, it, it, it's a lot of that lies on the recruiter or how well or not well the recruiter communicated how well how awesome it is to work for the organization. They have to be a salesperson. You can't just sit there at a job fair and just be playing on your phone because I've seen that before. They just play on the phone all day and expect people to just show up and give their, their resumes. No, you've got to get out there. you got to be on front street. you got to be the appetizer of that great meal to show what what's coming next. You know, so they have to be that cheerleader for the organization so people can get excited. So I don't I don't disagree with you, but I also want to caution that you know, salespeople at times have bad reputations for a reason. I can say this as someone who um, believes that they are a, have been a career salesperson. So yeah. I, I know this uh, firsthand. And, and, and the reason is at times uh, salespeople look to oversell. And that's where I would just want to point out that a recruiter's job should never be to overstate uh, uh, you know, the attractiveness of a job or, or really overstate anything associated with the job. Because the goal of a recruiter, the ultimate goal is not just to attract uh, the candidates, but to attract the candidates who will stay and remain happy as, as employees for as long as possible for, you know, indefinitely. So I just... You know, I always interject that where I, I believe you're, you're right and I, I support the statement, but to a limit, right? You're not okay. supposed to be, you're only supposed to be a um, salesperson in the sense of uh, you know, being pleasant and communicative and accessible and enthusiastic, all of that. But you're, don't be a salesperson, don't be a um, snake oil salesperson. Let, let, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's with anything, right? But everything you just described is exactly what I would want and you will want a, a recruiter to be. Absolutely. But no, yeah, I mean, it, it's a, obviously there's that 10% that gives the other 90% a bad name, right? You know, trying to sell somebody a bridge or, you know, because I remember back in the day, back in the 80s, uh, we bought Encyclopedia Britannica from a door-to-door -door salesperson. <laughs> so I think I still have those. Um, okay, well, we all did, right? So those... <laughs> that was our Google, kids. That was our Google. But, but uh, you, yes, I mean, that is... Uh, you have many, many uh, homework uh, reports uh, were done <laughs> using that, right? Because yeah. otherwise you had to go to the library. Crazy, crazy uh, to, to think that that's... Uh, that wasn't that long ago. But okay, so to you, to you, a recruiter, should it be too salesy but they should be salesy enough to be authentic in in their communication about coming Absolutely. to work for the organization all right makes well, sense I can sum it up with the phrase that i've used more times than i can count and anyone around me um at work has probably heard it more times than they would like which is we are not, sucks. you know recruiter should not oh, be in the with it what and man <laughs> sucks because <laughs> yeah, yeah. i heard you say that a couple of times <laughs> that, that uh that that uh recruiters should not be in the round um whole square peg business, meaning Correct. your goal is to find the right fit mutually that always. And as a good salesperson would do, you, you, you would uh, approach it that way and really try to find the winning solution on both sides. Okay. So good. We got that out of the way. Now back, <laughs> back to the issue at hand. It, and that is when onboarding begins and you say it begins right from the moment um, that they uh, apply. You, yeah, a candidate applies or you engage with the candidate on any level. Okay. So 
Um, walk us through it then. D d uh, give us an overview of, of onboarding, if you wouldn't mind, and then okay. switch over to orientation. So let me let me give you a short synopsis of what onboarding looks to me. So somebody is at a new, not a new employer, I'm sorry, somebody is at a job fair, right? They have the whole setup. They have a whole setup that tells the story of the organization. We don't just want employees. We want people to come in and share our vision. We want people to come in and understand what our core values are and make them their own, personalize their core values to ours, and then we can have a really good work-employee relationship. So if you're able to capture their emotion, their heart, and I know this sounds hokey, I, I completely get it, because people don't go into a job fair because they want to, they want to feel warm and fuzzy inside. It, it, let's be honest, they got bills to pay. Right. We got bills to pay. And let's let's be honest about that. But there are other things out there in an organization that that can be valuable for an employee that maybe they don't know is valuable to them. So communicate everything that the organization can offer. Now, let's say they they apply. Right. And then you, the recruiter, give them a call. Hey, we liked your 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 application. Let me explain to you a little bit more about the organization. Again, the cheerleader for the organization the advocate for the organization and how their skill set can work in the overall picture. As soon as a candidate feels that they fit perfectly, they're going to continue on with that interview process. And then if they go to the next step, you have a conversation with them again to let them know what they can expect. The entire process, you as the recruiter, you're going to be that person's mentor, that person's first point, only point of contact, and that person's GPS. That works a lot better, Pete, and it retains a lot more candidates to continue on with the recruitment process than getting that email that says, um, um, hey, thank you for your for your resume. Either you're going to the next step or you don't. You got to put the human touch to it and get them involved and really touch that emotion that gets them excited to come to work. So that's the first part of it. Any so questions? Let, let, yeah, I do, because yeah. th I, I, I don't mean to take us in this direction again, but I think this is me as a as someone who's been the third party recruiter my, mm -hmm. my whole career, where um, at what point do you interject the not so good news? Now, that is do you consider that part of onboarding? Because by by my uh, definition or, or perspective on onboarding begins a little bit later once the hiring decision has been made. But I, but in the recruiting process, I always want to interject the downside of, of a job to a candidate. And my philosophy on that being, um, let's get all the bad out. Right? And, 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 and if we do that correctly and we're honest and open and thorough about it, we're only going to be left with good. So where do you, it, it suggests that being brought in or is that is that just that doesn't sound like onboarding to you because no, no it does it does because you want to onboard the right person who's going to stick around right a, a, a recruiter who thinks long term is the recruiter who has the best interest in the organization at heart right and what does that mean if the recruiter is worried about making numbers a smart recruiter wouldn't focus at the numbers that just come in they're going to focus on the people who are going to come in and be the best fit for the organization to stick around for the long haul where the organization can make a good return on investment right at the end of the day that's why the organization is in business right um but you you say a phrase that i believe in and i've heard this a long time ago but good news early no bad news early is good news yep right so Get it out. You know, it, it say, look, if you're going to work at a call center, look, this is our call center. Here's where we work. Say, oh, put out there all those things, the, the nitty gritty of the organization. I mean, not everything, right? Because you get your 5% of employees who hate working wherever they are. But communicate what the good aspects and the aspects that are, might not be so, so desirable. So here's a great example. In a conversation, let's say I see a resume and I'm like, wow, this person used to work at a call center and I'm recruiting for a call center. I think this person is great for this position to have a conversation about it at the very least. But the person tells me when I ask them, why did you leave your last job? Oh, I hate working at call centers. All right. <laughs> That's a good example. You should right. flag on the play, right? Let's have a conversation about that and say, well, this is a call center. So I don't think this is the right opportunity for you. And then go from there. So yes, communicate that information early. Okay, I like it. So now we've we've done that. Employees getting ready to start. You know, keep keep going, and and, and again, exactly. let us know when um, orientation kicks in. Well, they haven't started yet, right? So this is also part of onboarding, right? And then you let them know if they go to the next interview, what's going to happen if there's a second interview or a third interview. 
right? You always keep in contact with them. Now, here's, here's something that a previous organization did that I love. If we get to the point where we, we're down to three people, right, and you only need one, you're going to have to make three phone calls. One of them is happy. Two of them are not going to be as happy, right? So that's when you call the person who got the job first, and you let them know, congratulations, blah, 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 blah. Here's what's happening, and you let them know what to expect. You're going to start in two weeks, send them a bouquet of flowers, send them some nice wine glasses. Welcome to the team. If through the entire interview process, they mentioned the love, I don't know, um, uh, a Chick-fil-A, send them a Chick-fil-A platter, something to really personalize that experience. Now, I know this part may not be considered onboarding, but follow me here. You also should have a conversation with the other two people who didn't get it. And let them know why. Give them some feedback, right? But you got to give them the bad news early. Hey, want to give you a call. Want to let you know you were not selected. But I got some really good feedback for you. Are you open to that? And send them a bouquet of flowers. Oh, I thought you were going to say send them to Ant-Man. No, no. Get rid of Tidy. Now, Ricky, you're, you're, okay, that's a, that's a, that is a, an extremely, um, generous thing mm -hmm. in my opinion, which, I mean, how many companies if you had to Not assign many. a percentage, will send something of that nature to employees who didn't, who weren't selected. At, I mean, the end. Phenomenal if they do, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be, I mean, what an amazing gesture. But how often does that happen, really? I'm, I'm uh, not familiar with that happening really ever. I know an organization uh, who did that quite a bit. I was part of the process uh, to to implement that because here's what happens, Pete. Instead, instead of having somebody, two people feel bad that they didn't get the position, let's make them feel some kind of way that because at dinner that night, what do you think they're going to talk about? Well, I mean, hey, how no was that interview? That, I mean, that would be, like I said, a phenomenal gesture. However, I don't know how practical it is. I don't know how common it is. I, I see very rare. I mean, but what a great differentiator if you're looking to uh, build your reputation in, uh, in a way that, that most will not um, you know, be willing to do. Um, but nonetheless, that, that's, that, that's a great thing. So that's what you're, you're, you recommend to your clients right. uh, to do. Um, I suspect most don't take you up on it. They don't. Some, some don't. don't. Some don't. Right? Some do. Some do. Yeah. Um, but the ones that do, here's what I tell them, because yeah, obviously they're worried about practicality. They're worried about, you know, God, how much money is this going to cost? Not just to marketing dollars. People are going to talk about that experience and people are going to remember that experience. And if you got people who advocate on your behalf on social media, that's great publicity. It really is. And for the two clients that are actually doing it, it's working out pretty good because that's some people that apply because they heard from somebody else. They know the process. So, OK, so we're there. We made an offer. OK, now this is all part of onboarding still. Right. You give those two week notice. Uh, uh, the person gives those two week notice and you still keep in contact with that person. Start giving them little pieces of information of what to expect uh, for for new employee orientation for your first day. Or maybe give them some homework. Right. Give them a couple of videos to let them know what the organization is. It's all about from an employee's perspective. That way they know how you know what to expect. Boom. Come day one. There's your orientation. That is when you come in on the first day. Now, from a recruiter's perspective or a company's perspective, you should not start prepping for it on the day the employee shows up. You should start prepping for it about a week early to make sure you got their login credentials, to make sure they have everything they need, their workstation is set up. Be ready for this person to come in. You know, right? Yeah, I, will, I want to jump in on that because yeah. uh, it's such an important thing and it happens – now that happens in a, a surprisingly uh, f with surprising frequency mm -hmm. where c employees will start and the organization is not prepared to receive them properly to, to orient uh, them properly, if you will. And we see that um, in our world of contract staffing because we have people placed in what may, where often HR is not involved. And that's probably why it happens in contract staffing because we don't have uh, a lot of times someone like you um, with your perspective and, and experience and, and way of looking at things to properly prepare to receive that uh, new contract employee. But here's uh, the reality. The contract employee wants to feel that they're treated well. Yep. Of course, everyone does. And to the whatever as much of a degree as possible, they want to feel 
is if they're treated the same as a direct employee, meaning welcomed and, and anticipated and um, just brought into the, the family, so to speak. But it's easy to see why it doesn't happen always on contract staffing. So make the effort if you can, if you're a hiring manager who maybe is not uh, inclined to think like an HR person does, yeah. professional does, reach out to your HR team, ask for some tips um, on that to make sure that your first, uh, you know, the day your employee walks in, they're felt welcomed. And I, and I mean, yeah, we have lots and lots of stories of this. If I don't have, no one thought to order them a computer or yeah. a badge or even tell them how to get in the building. So a lot of the things that I think HR covers and takes, you, you could take for granted because of that fall by the wayside sometimes in con- in the world of contracts. It does. And, and, and look, Pete, I, I know I know some of the rationale with not having everything ready because there has been a history of, you know, some some candidates ghosting employers. Right. And they just wasted all this resources all this time. Some people with their HRIS system or their uh, their uh, payroll system, they get they get charged monthly by how many um, accounts they have open. So if they open two or three accounts and two or three people don't show up, that's money they're they're wasting. I get that. I completely get that. But. The opposite is worse. No, the the I'm sorry. The opposite is better because here's what happens. If you are not ready for this employee, this employee, when they accept that job, Pete, you and I have had this conversation. They have a little voice in the back of their head that says, God, I don't know if I made the right decision. I don't know if this is the right thing for me to do. The evil I know is better than the evil I don't know. And if they show up unprepared, you know, if, 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 if they show up and you're not prepared for them, the organization is giving credibility to those words. They're giving credibility to, to those voices. So what I tell my clients is it is our job to shut those voices up in that person's head, make them feel welcome, and make them feel like the decision they made was 100% the right one. I've seen people show up um, uh, to the organization where the organization wasn't unprepared. They just left. They, their, their career with the organization was a whopping 18 minutes. 18 and minutes. It, it, well, it happens. It happens yeah. a lot. And it's easy to see why. It's understandable, especially in contract staffing. You mentioned HR yep. system. A lot of things are preset in there. So it will follow a process. Prompts will happen. So that people are reminded to That's right. take whatever step they need, whether it's order a badge, put them in their um, ERP system, order equipment, have a workstation, whatever it might be. But on contract staffing in particular, because of course that's where so much of my thought often goes, it's easy to see why since they're never in the HR system in the first place, none of those triggers (laughs) will naturally happen. So something to think about in that world. So they're but they're but they arrive and and we're ready for them. Now now again, I want you I'm gonna keep pressing you until you define it for us. Okay. What's the difference? Or we've been talking about onboarding, and then you said, well, now they're ready for orientation. So where what's what where's where does that difference lie? So onboarding, remember, it starts when they apply all the way until training. Orientation is just one, maybe two days. That's it. Orientation, the only thing, the whole purpose of orientation is to orient, obviously, the 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 brand new employee to the culture of the organization. Let them know about the handbook, let them know their, about their benefits, and the most important thing of all, their pay. Make sure they know when they get paid, what they need to do. They get all the faculties together, all the tools together to get them started on the right foot for training, right? Now, so, so orientation is that one day on day one when they get all this information, right? That's orientation. The very next day, if it's a, you know, just regular organization, they start training. Onboarding is still going, okay. right? Because part of onboarding is to make sure we assign somebody to, to that organization. I'm sorry, that part of onboarding is that, sorry, we have to make sure we assign like a big brother, big sister, a mentor to that employee because that employee is not going to know everybody right away that employee is not going to so they need that one person above and beyond that recruiter to make sure that they can go to like a big brother or sister that helps pete so much oh for sure right it it all leads to the new employee's comfort and and having access to information knowing who to Mm -hmm. turn to i mean what what a great thing um it seems like a no-brainer probably doesn't happen all the time uh, but but it should. We agree it should. And so. can we talk about something real quick? Why it doesn't happen all the time? Because 
I think it's important for us to to address that. So a lot of people, a lot of organizations say, Ricky, we just don't have the resources. We're short staff as it is, right? We got other people pulling two or three different jobs because people have left. And I get all that. I get it. But if you knew the value on making sure onboarding and orientation is done right, you will make time for it. The value is immense because if you calculate how much time, money, and effort is spent on on marketing, hiring, interviewing, and then paying this person while they're in training, not getting a return on investment, and having that person leave within 30 days of, of starting, that's not that that's not good for the PL. That's not good for the PL. No doubt. So yeah, so 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 yes, there's a lot of organizations out there that are spread out thin. All I'm saying is get creative and make sure you make the employees feel welcome. Perfect. Okay. So orientation. First day, right? One day. Come in, you've been pre-boarded. Is that a phrase you use? Pre-boarding? Um I, I used pre-board when when um, uh, we used to do this. Over, actually, we still do it. Pre-boarding to me is when you, it's we start getting everything ready. Like if I hear this person likes um, uh, uh, Reese's peanut butter cups or Mountain Dew, I'm gonna have that waiting for uh, for that at that person's desk, right? To me, that is the the rolling out the red carpet and welcome at. To me, that's pre-boarding. Okay, so so the, so that's so that's part of the onboarding process person gets there, they go through orientation, they meet their new co-workers, they fill out paperwork, they are given a tour. These all sound right. like orientation things to me, right? Given a tour? Yeah, I mean, yes, that way they know where finance is, they know where their desk is. I know is where the bathroom through. is. Someone I know where the bathroom has, <laughs> has to be. We all need to know that. We all have to know that. Right? It's a way, you know, again, that's all part of orientation, right? Okay. Orientation is still specific things, but onboarding is a much longer process that goes through training. So how that's long, important. how long can it last? And so we've said orientation a day or two max, but what about onboarding? What's a normal time frame? It depends on the organization. I've seen onboarding that lasts a week. I've seen onboarding that lasts two months. Right. It depends on 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 the organization and how deep rooted it is with all different types of satellite offices. And it depends on the job as well. I, yeah. I would say it, even longer, right? Is it pr- provided wow. uh, the training program lasts longer? Because uh, that's true. really the point where you, you know, w- when you're out of training, whatever that means to you as a, a, the individual organization, to me, that is the point where onboarding ends, where the new hire, the day they're sitting uh, at their desk or workstation, wherever it might be, to then you know be let out into the world, pushed out of the nest to, to behave <laughs> autonomously, that is the point where it, I think it's over. Is that fair? That's fair. That's fair. Because again, it, it's when I started my and I share with you how I started in HR, I got there by mistake. And right. when and when I told Hubert Associates, hey, I don't know anything about HR. They said they're going to train me. They trained me for three months, Pete. Three months. I didn't know a thing about benefits. I didn't know what an HMO was. right? But they trained me. They had an amazing onboarding process because they made sure I was never lost, especially somebody who doesn't have a background in it. They assigned me a mentor to make sure I was comfortable. And if at any moment in time, if I didn't like it, let's have a conversation. Now, let's go back real quick. Um, I think we, we've talked about this before. There's a company out there called Zappos. You've heard of it, right? Yes. Yep. They got bought out by uh, by uh, Amazon about 10, 15, about 10 years ago. But before they were bought out by Amazon, there was a big story out there. And I've seen this firsthand where when somebody wants to start at Zappos at the end of orientation, at the end of training, they say, if you don't want to start, I will give you $3,000 right now to just walk away. And at first you're like, what in the world? We just spent all this money on this, but it is a genius move, genius move. Because if the employee finds that $3,000 is more valuable, they'll leave and they'll save the organization money because they probably will stick around for six months to a year getting paid that salary. That's going to be way more than those $3,000. It's a genius move. I'm not oh, saying I we should do it. that. <laughs> I know. I, I love the, I love the plan. It's great foresight and an understanding of what you're really looking for in uh, a successful employee. That's right. I, I love the idea. I'm surprised it's not more prevalent. Uh, right. The, yeah. Their success has, has been so obvious. So, um, and it's a great organization. Uh, no, know that it's great specifically for that reason. I still use them. 
Um, I didn't even realize they were bought by Amazon. So the Zappos oh, yeah. brand and, and website hasn't changed. Uh, no, it has not. But they but they are owned by Amazon. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Amazon I remember I remember when it first happened, um, I was reading a story about this in the Wall Street Journal, that everybody that was already a Zappos employee that became an Amazon employee, they got stock, which they're probably millionaires by now because this was back uh, a while back. And they got uh, Kindles, uh, Kindle fires. <laughs> Oh, well, OK. Well, they got the stock, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making fun of you guys, but iPad. <laughs> OK, so we uh, I think we've I think we've covered it. I think we uh, you know, we've done a good job of defining. It. You have done a good job of defining it and explaining the differences. I appreciate that. Um, anything else you'd like to add? Parting uh, parting thought on. Uh, yes. Yes. Parting thoughts. So so here's one more thing. Right. We bring the person on board, whatever energy the organization had to bring the person on board. You've got to have that same energy, that same planning to make sure we retain the person. Let's get, let's make sure that we put that person's skill set in the right positions, right? Let's make sure we give them one-on-ones. Let's not push them in any direction. Just like the, the recruiter needs to be that GPS, that person's manager needs to be the career GPS for that employee. That way they feel fulfilled. Employees today, Employees today want to have a more meaningful connection with their employees bigger than before because a lot of Gen Z's are out there. Yeah. Gen Z's employees, are out there right employees now. with their employers, right? They yes. Want, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. I, I knew what you meant. I just want to clarify. What did I say? I'm sorry. What did I say? You, you, you probably said it right. Uh, but <laughs> just in case. Got it. Yes. But, but, but the point is, is a, is a great one. And, and so true from my experience and, and everything that I see, which is yes, employers have to portray themselves differently to attract a large number of um, of, of young people in the workforce today, right. where they want to find more meaning for, uh, from that relationship than have it be just a job. So I think that's um, that is something to be well aware of uh, for sure, and because it's not going to change uh, anytime that soon, I don't believe. And then what happens is you end up if you do everything right, you end up with an environment that that is that it, it's it's bu it's mutually beneficial, right? The employer that's, is happy. That's always the goal, that's absolutely. Cool. And the employee is happy, and then you get up and you start recording podcasts, not knowing there was a memo for great T-shirts. And look at this, look at and, look at what happened here. This happens naturally. <laughs> so that's that's, that's what perfect. We want. Awesome. Well, Ricky, thank you so much. As always, today that was that was wonderful. You delivered what was asked. Awesome. Thank that. you. I appreciate it. So if you've been listening this far. Please follow us on all our social channels and give us a like, give us a review. Five stars only, of course. We would appreciate that. But if you have uh, questions or comments for future topics, we'd love to hear that too. So respond to us on any of our channels. We do monitor all of that. And um, thank you again. Ricky, have a happy, great weekend. Happy Cinco de Mayo, folks. Have a good one.